one afternoon in 1967, out of the blue, Zanny came home and said he wanted to sell the Esso station and put a down payment on a motel just outside of town. His brother John had told him all about it. John had a, mot a hotel in Baton Rouge and was getting tired of the city, so he was interested in it for himself. But the idea of running a place like that, especially if we had all the kids helping out, made a lot of sense to Zanny too. The possibility that the place could provide for our family and that Zanny and I could work together and still be at home helped convince me to say yes. It wasn't the big house or all the space on the property. It, it was that I could see the potential for us to make a good life for all of us there. What I couldn't see then was how hard it was going to be. In hindsight, it did turn out to be a good place to provide for our family. And it was a great time, a great home for us all. We had room for all the kids in that big house, but it took everything we had to make it work. For the first few years we were in the motel, I kept the beauty shop going. Tuesdays through Sundays, I was right here in this shop all day. Then I'd go home to the motel at night. And the kids kept growing up, each one a very different person. After Thomas, I had Scotty and finally Elisa. And thank God for them, because without them, I'd have really gone crazy. I'd have had strangled Zanny a long time ago. Cassie was my first musical one. At a very early age, she was singing and wanted a guitar like her cousin Darwin. For many kids, a musical instrument is a passing phase, but ever since we gave her her first guitar, she was hooked for life. Andy? Well, Andy beat the odds. He had childhood epilepsy, which can really stunt a little person. But he punched his way out of it by the time he was six, and even with Zanny's terrible treatment of him, he grew up and made a good life for himself. He was never comfortable at school. But despite his self-doubts, he learned a lot of other things on his own. He loved the outdoors, nature, animals, hunting, and made those things priorities in his adult life. Gilda and Glenda, my twins, are easy to lump together because they're so much alike, but at the same time, they are very different people. There was always a kind of competitiveness that each of them had, not necessarily with each other, but they were always very competitive. Morris would ultimately be my middle child. I, I knew right away that he was the baby in the, when he was a baby in the family that he was going to have to learn to be strong. A mother always knows when one of her children is not like the others. Growing up, he didn't know how to be a boy. Zanny picked up on this, and if you ask me, it was the reason he was so hard on him. I think Zanny thought he could toughen him up and make him change. As he got older, Morris was a lot like Cassie in his relationship with me. He always sought my advice. My other kids didn't seem to care what I thought, but he did. I saw him leaving the house one January day without a hat on his head. He was so self-conscious about his looks. I told him, you need something on your head. When he objected, I said, there's no hat ugly as vanity. Then there was Dickie. I had to hide my purse from Dickie because he was always going through it looking for gum. Dickie was like Morris in that he was not a typical boy. And we saw that right away. As a toddler, he loved getting into my makeup and jewelry box and hiding. One Sunday, we panicked because he was missing, so we looked all over the house for him, and I finally found him asleep in my closet. I asked him why he was there, and he said he liked the smell. Of all my kids, I think he, was the most, he has the most tender soul. Those four, Gilda, Glenda, Morris, and Dickie, were the closest group for several years. They mostly grew up together. They played together, did their motel work, then played some more around that dining room table, and they stuck together pretty much until one by one they became teenagers and began going their separate ways. I know for certain, I know, I'm sorry, I know the children, uh, I know for children the years pass very slowly, but then their teen years start and everything starts moving so fast. So for my 20 years at that motel, we all grew up a bit. It was hard, but it was a hard but rewarding life, and I was feeling toward the end there that it was definitely time for a new phase. In the last few years, I often told Zanny, I can't wait till we can sell this place one day. I don't know how many times I said it, but I said it a lot and I meant it. But Zanny always had an excuse about why it wasn't a good time to sell. It turns out it was never a good time to sell. But I was really, really tired. And that idea, and the idea that I'd be trapped in that life forever with just him in that big house hired me out even more. My last two years on this earth were really hard for me. I didn't feel like talking to anybody except my mom and Bill Platt. She was lonesome and I was depressed. But those trips to see her each week, sometimes twice a week, if I could get the energy to go, were what I lived for. 
Without those trips to see my mom, I might as well have been dead. I had no desire whatsoever to be at home alone with Annie. I spent most of my nights and days those last couple of years lying on the sofa in the living room with my face hidden from the world. One rare day, I was feeling good enough to go run some errands in town. I get to St. Landry Bank, and, and the teller, a new girl who didn't know me, even though I'd been banking with him for 30 years, asked me for some idea, ID to make a deposit. I searched around in my purse but uh, for my driver's license and I couldn't find it. Marianne Lachelet, who, who knows me, was working at the next window and she vouched for me. Anyway, when I got home, I emptied out my purse and couldn't find my license at all. Then I searched all over the house for it. I needed that license. The only thing keeping me even a little sane and happy those days was my weekly drive to Ville Platte to see my mama. I had to have my license. So the next morning, I, I head, head down, uh, headed to town to get my license replaced. I waited in line for a while, and when it was my turn, the girl at the window said I needed my old license to renew my license. She wasn't listening to me. But I can't find it. That's why I'm here. Sorry, ma'am, she says. If it was stolen, then there'd be no problem. But since you say you only misplaced it, you're going to have to do a better job of looking for it. Now, aren't you? I was so mad I couldn't think straight. I left and drove home, burning up inside. I got home and got Zanny to help me look all over the place again, but it was nowhere to be found. I was so frustrated. I really just wanted to lie down on my sofa again and forget the whole thing. Or better yet, if I could have, I, I, I would have been, it would have been such a help to come here in my shop again, where I could figure it all out and calm down and get a hold of myself. But this shop and all my kids, except Elisa, were gone, and since she'd be gone too. I was tired. I was so tired. But I got in that truck, determined to get to the license place and get back in that line and get to the window and insist that that girl give me a new license. Then and there, damn it. It was the only thing I had left for me. And so all of that, that's what was in my head when I went through that intersection that day. It wasn't suicide, you know. I didn't kill myself. I know people I left behind would like to know the truth about that. But that's not why I'm saying it now. Not for their comfort. Although I'm happy to comfort them with this information. I really didn't do it deliberately. When I stopped at that intersection and looked around, I wasn't capable of seeing that truck driver or anybody coming. So I stopped and then drove straight ahead. Like it was all clear. Because in my mind, it was. That's it. Thank you. Uh, the book is called Stone Motel. Again, sorry for the delay today. That's um, me having been overprepared and at the last minute being told I had to change my um, browser um, to a newer version. Um, so I did that. Um, so again, sorry for that. Um, you can get this book right now at Barnes & Noble in Lafayette. Call them up at 337 989 4142 and they'll drop it off to you at curbside 337-989-4142 if you're not in the Lafayette area you can get it on bornesandnoble.com and anywhere books are sold and thanks to the University Press of Mississippi the publisher you can get it at, on their website too it's University Press of Mississippi look them up thanks everybody hope to see you all soon in person and sign some books bye bye <laughs>